on mute connect. Okay, good afternoon, everyone. I suppose you can all hear me well and see me well. Welcome to the Placemaking for Public Innovation webinar organized by Placemaking Europe. My name is Milena Ivkovic. I'm a board member of Placemaking Europe and also the board executive of the Association Placemaking Western Balkans based in Belgrade in Serbia. Um, this uh, fourth seminar is organized together by Placemaking Europe Foundation and the City of The Hague. And uh, for those who are uh, with us for the first time, I would just like to remind you that we have already three discussions uh, about placemaking. And the first one was about the health and well being and placemaking, how it can help well being in cities. The second discussion that we have was about the placemaking and mobility. And the third discussion, the third webinar we held was on the climate action, placemaking for climate action. Uh, today in our fourth webinar, we're going to dive into the question of placemaking and public innovation, what it means for public innovation and what could be the strategies to overcome the bureaucratic hurdles and a lot of roadblocks that sometimes we encounter in a placemaking process. Uh, to put more light on this topic, I am very pleased to welcome a couple of international speakers, but also uh, uh, speakers from the city of Den Haag uh, who will be presenting case studies from that city. I hope that the webinar will be very inspiring, and I also hope that we can all discuss together the issue of placemaking for, um, placemaking for public innovation. Uh, just briefly, uh, a brief introduction of, uh, of our speakers. Uh, there will be a representative of the city of The Hague, Mr. Matthijs van Muijen, who is a policy, a policy advisor uh, at the Department of uh, Housing in, in the city of The Hague. Then we will have our dear colleague, Daniel Radai, uh, who is a deputy mayor responsible for urban development in the eighth district municipality of the city of Budapest in Hungary. He will bring us today a case study from the city of Budapest. And we have a third speaker from, uh, uh, from Finland, Mr. Tommy Laitio, who is a public innovation fellow at the Bloomberg Center for Public Innovation at Johns Hopkins University. He will join us today from Baltimore. So good morning to you, uh, uh, Tommy. And he will give a broader overview of 
public innovation and how it helps to create better cities. So I suggest we start with a reflection from Tommy. Uh, then later on, we will have the opportunity to see the case study from The Hague and Matthijs. And we will finish this first part of the session uh, of, of uh, recorded presentations from the Budapest case study uh, from Daniel. Uh, I will be uh, moderating the whole webinar, but also moderating the discussion and the Q&A. I will like to encourage, encourage you all to um, put your questions already, whatever it comes up to your mind, just put it in the chat. We will collect them and uh, present them at the, um, in the second part of the webinar. So uh, I hope uh, that you will enjoy it. And also we will be posting in chat uh, box some more information about myself and other speakers. So you can just uh, take a look there as well. So let's start now with the first video from Tommy and his reflection on the role of public innovation and how can we use public innovation to enable the change that we need in our cities and how to be more responsive to the current needs of residents, what, what has placemaking as a role and what is the potential of placemaking in that. Um, he will also explore four, four themes that he finds the most crucial when thinking about public innovation and developing public spaces in general in our cities. So please, uh, I would like to invite Marta to share the video from Tommy and enjoy the video. So good afternoon, everyone, and thank you for having me for this for this session. Um, my name is Tommy Laitio. I am today speaking from Baltimore, but I come originally from Helsinki in, in Finland. And I'll highlight today four themes that I've learned about how public innovation works uh, well in a, in a city context. My, my background is that I, for the last decade, I worked for the city government of, of Helsinki. I joined from a think tank uh, to run the youth department for, for the city. And then for the last five years, I acted as the executive director for culture and leisure, which meant the city's arts and culture policy, sports services, the public library system and youth work. So things that make cities fun, uh, services that are voluntary for people to join. So you have to find the right balance between making things that people want and making things that people need. I'm currently on a, on a two-year fellowship here in the US uh, that's created for public sector leaders to take a moment to think and reflect on what they've learned about good public services and do research uh, on an issue that they find important that it matters for public innovation. And my research focuses actually very much on the themes that we're discussing today on what are the skills and practices local governments need for building partnerships for parks and public libraries. So how can cities and municipalities develop public spaces together with, with residents the business community, philanthropy, or universities. I work in a center that's called Bloomberg Center for Public Innovation that was set up last year by Bloomberg Philanthropies, an American foundation, and Johns Hopkins University, one of America's best uni universities, with the ambition to bring better together the world of academic research and the world of, of practical services for cities and citizens, and really how we can improve public services and improve public trust. And we currently work with over 40 cities on three continents on themes from civic engagement to digital practices to innovation methods. So my, my work, my background is in service delivery for residents. And based on that, I wanted to highlight today four notions or themes that I think are relevant when we think about public innovation and developing public spaces. The first theme has to do with the difference between defining a challenge and, and the solutions to that challenge. I think at least I have a tendency sometimes to jump very quickly to thinking about how we solve this. A lot of us have joined government with the idea of solving things and fixing things, but I think good public innovation processes take enough time to, to really make sure that we are actually solving a problem that matters to people. And my most 
moving experience on this was when we worked on integration of migrant youth in Helsinki. We saw from our data that it, that it was seven times more likely for young people to be young people with a migrant background to be outside education and workforce. And we decided together with a local foundation to actually spend a year understanding this problem, talking to young people, talking to people who work with young people, uh, bringing young people and professionals together to really make sure on what's the issue that we're trying to solve here. Because when we talk to people, the problem looks very different than it looks on statistical data. And what we heard from young people is something that we had not realized to the, to the fullest at, at City Hall, which was that they actually felt that they had a lot of skills that were underutilized by the society. They didn't want to be objects of help. They wanted opportunities. So all the solutions that we built were built on this idea that we have to provide opportunities for them to use their skills for the benefit of others. And the most successful program was one where we linked senior citizens who needed company and a bit of help at home, but didn't need a healthcare professional and young people who had difficulties entering the workforce. So we created work opportunities for, for young people to help seniors. And by now, I think we've created around 50, 1,500 um, young people have had opportunities to, to have their first work experience. And when you've helped seniors, World War II veterans, it's so much easier for you to get a job in the open labor market after that. But only by investing in the discovery phase and the scoping phase, we got to this approach that's motivating also for, for young people. The second theme that I would highlight has to do with placemaking and how I think successful public places really create that kind of physical experience of what it means to live in a democracy with other people. And, and when we're successful with that, they're not only functional spaces, but they are actually spaces of local pride. And my best experience from this is when we opened the Central Library, Audi in the center of Helsinki in 2018, um, it has now become the, the main symbol of the city. A lot of locals say that if you want to understand Helsinki, if you want to know who we are at our best, come to Audi. A lot of people bring their guests to Audi to, to explain what Finland and Helsinki is about. And it's, it's not an accident that this project was successful. It's the biggest resident engagement, uh, a creative resident, resident engagement project in the whole country ever. The, we spent 10 to 20 years listening to residents on what they dream about, what's a good life for them, and th then really testing different, different new solutions in the branch libraries. So when we opened this magnificent new building in the center of Helsinki, the reaction we got from people was like, oh, I've seen that before, or that's actually what I wished for, or that's meeting my need, but it's so much better than what I could have imagined. And the I think that's when creative public innovation is successful when we manage to top people's expectations. So we meet them and go a bit over them. That's, I think, what, what a public good public service looks like. The third example that I would highlight has to do with collaboration. Governments need to be better in working with, with other organizations, but also government departments need to be better in working with each other. And I would say a good collaboration combines this sense of me and we. This idea that I have choice, I have agency, my professional expertise is, is respected, but I'm also doing something that's bigger than just my job. I'm joining into something that's that's so much bigger than, than my department or my team or, or my daily practice. And for me, the best experience from this in Helsinki is a city level physical activity program that we've been running now, I think for five or six years. This idea that we recognize that the lack of movement is one of the one of the greatest public health challenges uh, developed countries have, and we wanted to build a program on research where we have a clear goal: more movement, more steps. But then building a city level program where the professionals in different services feel like they have agency over what does movement look like in sports, in kindergartens, in senior care. And I think successful programs manage to combine good, solid research base, a very simply put goal, and then the fact that people have agency in their own work. And when someone's successful in, in some of the other departments, 
we all feel like we're moving forward. I think that's what successful public innovation looks like. And the final example that I would highlight is how government works with other organizations. Government sometimes is the kind of the gentle giant that when it starts moving, it's, it becomes a bit scary for other organizations. We are so much bigger often than other organizations. And how we manage to ask for help and work with other organizations. And I think the best lesson that I've had on this was during COVID when we had the lockdown, um, when senior citizens were told to stay at home. We were in an unprecedented situation in the city. And I think for the first time, the city actually said openly, this is a challenge that we cannot meet. So the church chipped in, a lot of companies called and say, hey, use our cars, use our online, online services, use our digital tools, let's, let's solve this problem together. And within a week, we built a service where we called every single over 70 year old in Helsinki, checking if they need help uh, getting groceries or medication. And we tra trained city staff and church staff to, to deliver food, do these phone calls. And the, for, for the first time, the city did a service that is built on this idea that we call people and check if they need help. And this was, it. This was all done in a, in a matter of weeks and according to GDPR and according to, to all, the, all, the, all the other regulations. So we are able to do things in a phenomenal time if we really want to, when the ask is clear and we manage to ask for help. Thank you so much. Um, looking forward to the conversation with the with the other speakers and the and the audience and and tell you more about these and and also be be challenged by by the by your questions and comments. Thank you so much. Great. This was a wonderful, wonderful recording. And uh, Tommy is going to be with us live for the for the conversation. So please uh, write down everything you would like to ask Tommy. I'm I'm sure we will have a great dialogue a bit later on during the uh, during the webinar. Um, let me introduce now the second uh, uh, the second video, which is from the Hague, from Matthijs van Maaien, who will present its breakthrough plan project and how the city of The Hague is searching for creative solutions in regards to housing and how that will secure better accommodations and better living environment for all, all of those people who really need it the most. And uh, I would also like to underline that the city of The Hague is one of our Placemaking Europe partners for the city in, cities in placemaking program. So uh, let's start now with a video from Matthijs. Yeah, hello, I'm Matthijs van Mui. I'm a civil servant in The Hague for the housing department. Uh, we have a big challenge in The Hague to uh, give accommodation for all people that uh, have priority uh, on the housing market. Uh, unfortunately, uh, there's a long waiting list for uh, social housing, about six years. So some groups we have to give priority. For example, people that are in the shelter, uh, young people that come out of uh, youth protection, people that sort out of prison, uh, people that are in mentally hospital and are ready to uh, live in a single house. Uh, and uh, also we have a big group of uh, immigrants that has the permission to stay and has to be accommodated in uh, The Hague. We have a national target from the government uh, and we cannot fit this all in the uh, for the housing companies we have a, a certain number of houses each year about uh, 600 but the demand is more than thousand so we have to overcome this bridge uh, that's why we started the, the breakthrough plan uh, it was adopted by the mayor and his team uh, one and a half year ago, and right now we developed 20 projects to look for more space in The Hague and the region to accommodate all these people. Uh, the projects are, for example, uh, to transform empty buildings, offices, uh, hospitals, uh, elderly home, schools into housing. And we're talking about uh, independent housing uh, studios of 25 square meter with own kitchen and bathroom. 
and we want to offer a key to all these uh, uh, demand, these groups uh, that uh, are looking for a house. Very important is that we have uh, little projects, not uh, too much, 100 or 200 places. Uh, also, that is a good social help for these people that need uh, help. Um, and uh, we want also an equal distribution in all neighborhoods, not only the social housing neighborhoods, but also the neighborhoods with more high income and high uh, educated people. So that is a good spread about the city. I want to mention one project is the Leegwaterplein. It's near the uh, train station and the high school. There's a green field uh, and permanent housing is waiting five years. So we uh, decided to have a project with temporary housing under 20 people with 40 uh, people that are, come from the asyl, this immigrant, uh, 20 students with housing problems and also 60 starters on the housing market. We try to do this with placemaking and to involve the citizens that live around students but also institutes, schools, uh, to think about how can we make it an attractive place uh, with involvement with all these people, also to make it more green, uh, to uh, organize uh, a common uh, place where they can meet, for example, for culture, uh, and also uh, to, um, we also want to join the school. They have a, a square that is very boring and no place to sit. So also students are involved and uh, we started uh, in spring this year and we want to execute it, implement it uh, next year. And we hope that we can accommodate 120 people for five years and also an attractive program to improve uh, the neighborhoods together with all these people. I want also to mention a second project is the Willem Drees House. Is it a former elderly home for 120 elderly people, uh, but it was almost empty and the city uh, decided to uh, start a project together with the housing company uh, to make it place for uh, people that sort out of uh, shelter. Uh, so about 60 former homeless people uh, uh, got a room there uh, to live and they uh, have now their own room with kitchen and, uh, and uh, bathroom. Uh, and now we are transforming it in a, also a place for uh, starters on the housing market. So it's a 50% former homeless and 50% regular uh, demand. We have also a garden uh, to develop and a, a good place for, for parking. And uh, we try to start a participation with the neighborhoods so that uh, people around can uh, talk about what they want in the common area and also to uh, have it a, a nice project for the neighborhood. Uh, there are a lot of parties involved and also a project to make it more uh, sustainable with solar panels and uh, a green uh, wall. Um, so that's, we try to, to have more support of the neighborhood for this project. And it's very nice to give a place for former homeless people. It's also a, a very costly, uh, the shelter costs 50,000 euro a year uh, for the city and it's not good for the people so we are very happy to give this opportunity and we hope to uh, develop more projects like this because we have a lot of homeless people in the Hague about more than 500 youngsters also and it's uh, better uh, to stay in a single studio uh, for your study or work than uh, to grow up in a shelter. I'm ready to answer your questions. Yeah, it's very important to uh, to organize the participation of uh, the people that live around and the institution around and the stakeholders. Uh, we had some examples in the Willem Drees house that we asked students uh, to think about the design of a new uh, nameplate and the facade. And we asked the school for graphic design uh, to think about it and they had an interview with uh, people and uh, citizens and they came with some designs and that will be considered to be implemented uh, uh, next year another example is uh, that there was an initiative of citizens to make the 
Willem Drake's house more sustainable with solar panels and a green wall. And there was also a little uh, uh, subsidy uh, for that, 50,000 euro. Um, and with that examples, I will show that it's important to involve people in the early stage and to give the floor for that. And also to give the conditions uh, how you can do it as a, as a local government. Yeah, for the bureaucracy, it's very important to uh, to know the bureaucracy, but also to uh, think about the project. And for the first project, the Leegwaterplein, uh, we started the participation of placemaking making, uh, before the formal decision of the local government. Uh, so we started in February with the first meeting with citizens and schools around the, the place to uh, have some ideas because it was also a big challenge to uh, give accommodation for uh, immigrants. We had some experience in uh, other neighborhoods that it will be uh, some suspense because not all citizens uh, are favored for these groups. But we, were, uh, we had a good experience uh, for this project and because people could think uh, about the project and give their ideas how to make the place more attractive with uh, a common area, more green, for example, some uh, parts for uh, participation of sports. Uh, all those, all these things were, were possible. We have also budget for that and that make it more uh, support uh, uh, from the neighborhood. And after that, uh, the formal uh, local government uh, took the decision to mention this project. So we were very happy to start this before the formal decision. And we think about to repeat it and other projects to uh, do this like this. Wonderful. Thanks, Matthijs. This is uh, uh, this is really a great presentation about the very sensitive topic of integration of uh, affordable housing and uh, groups that really need it uh, and how placemaking can help. We are going to dive into some questions about it a bit later, but now I would like to um, uh, invite or introduce the video from uh, Daniel Radai who will actually present three projects from the city of Budapest, enable the citizens to advocate for their needs and how to stimulate them to drive their own change in the public realm. But then with the help and the support of the municipality and civil servants of, uh, of the city. So uh, let's look from the uh, video from uh, Daniel Radai. Hi everyone. This is Daniel Radei. I'm the deputy mayor responsible for urban development in District 8 Budapest. I'm acting here kind of as a chief urban planner. I'm an urban planner by training. I did my master's in Tildoft, and I also lived in Den Haag for a year and a half. Uh, here I brought you three examples of our approach on uh, cit allowing citizens driving uh, public spaces. Um, so how we are engaging residents uh, to galvanize spaces and communities. Uh, so basically, we are uh, a municipality, a district in, uh, in Budapest, uh, in central Budapest, that has about 70,000 residents in seven square kilometers, quite a high density area. So therefore, our public spaces are incredibly important and public life, of course, even more. Um, our main uh, efforts are, uh, are targeting uh, healthy streets and a healthy city uh, that's so brilliantly captured by Lucy Saunders, British urban planner. And, um, and of course, that can, that can uh, involve public spaces and hardware, but also software and hardware. So the first example that I brought you is, um, is our public space adaptation program that means residents can adopt our public spaces. I don't think globally it's it's uh, it's that uh, innovative or that uh, completely out of the box because uh, I hope and I'm sure and I know that uh, many other places um, 
uh, take on many other cities take on the same approach. But for us, it's new. In Budapest, it's new, and it's a uh, it's a very based on our experiences, a quite uh, quite quite uh, positive story. So what we did as a pilot last year, one residential residential block central public space. Uh, we gave uh, we gave to a brilliant uh, NGO, uh, Rotary Club Budapest, to to actually maintain it, to use it uh, as their community center, uh, fill it with life, and uh, and basically take ownership of it. And uh, and with various events and, and happenings, this has been uh, growing to to be a great story, uh, and not just for for space ownership for residents but also to capture different communities and get together different communities, be that a cafe that employs uh, people uh, with disabilities, who live with disabilities, or, or NGOs who work with, uh, for example, minority groups, uh, such as, uh, such as uh, initiatives uh, that help uh, children's education, uh, gypsy children's education. And uh, practically in 2022, uh, so this year we launched a bigger scale kind of competition and application form to, to so that everybody can, can apply. And we got uh, this time nine applications, out of which six uh, there will be selected. And uh, each of them will get about 600 uh, euro uh, support. And altogether, uh, this cost about uh, 3,500 uh, uh, euro in total for the municipality as a support. And with that, uh, we are making sure that uh, both individuals and, uh, and, uh, and groups, so smaller communities can make sure that uh, they can take ownership and maintenance and uh, galvanization of their environment. Uh, and we think that we will uh, face a lot of brilliant uh, community activities on these spots. The second example, is our open street where a previously car used area we turned into a community zone. Pedestrian zone, place for terraces, place for sitting with a non consuming zone so everybody can uh, enjoy their own uh, food and drinks as well uh, on the public space, of course. And the tricky thing was, of course, that nobody's ever seen a project like this in Budapest. So we had to build up the entire mechanism behind it, both from bureaucracy to the technical aspects and public space use and bureaucratic measures. So we started cooperating with the cafes, uh, how they uh, take care of some furnitures and uh, how we take care of some other furnitures. Our maintenance company is involved uh, in, uh, in uh, taking care of different aspects, uh, how they deal with uh, budgeting if you need to implement something. And most importantly, of course, was how to make this a great space. And the first year, since um, unfortunately, in previous years, the municipalities didn't have a great relationship with uh, different uh, actors. So we were facing trouble uh, getting, getting this space active. And what we did, we actually made a very easy public space use. We kind of tricked our own bureaucracy eventually uh, by Practically, practically renting the space from ourselves. So one of our uh, agencies are having the public space use. So whoever wants to use the place only needs to basically write an email and then they get into the calendar. And the great things, of course, with that was that since there was a lack of trust for the municipalities, we, were, we managed to recreate this trust. And, uh, and practically by the end of the first summer, more and more uh, initiatives joined. And there we had a we had a big uh, participation, big uh, feedback uh, loop in the neighborhood. Everybody was uh, in favor of this project, so this pilot was successful. We practice new participatory approaches, and the second year now we are back with an even more enhanced program, and uh, participants get to use it even easier. And the third example is uh, is our uh, corner program in uh, one of our main streets where a previously car-oriented space turned into some tactical pedestrian-friendly area. However, since we did it during COVID, we were facing a lot of trouble uh, properly galvanizing it, properly making uh, it as a place for, for communities. And also the design was uh, not so sufficient, of course. And once the design was getting better, finally now we have the chance to make proper community events. And of course, particularly allow bottom-up community events 
to take ownership of this place, uh, fill it with uh, their joy and their life. And again, of course, we are using our bureaucratic levels and public space use measures uh, and reinvent these legislations and ordinances. So it becomes as easy as possible for residents to paint their asphalt, to organize small events, and most importantly, to get together on these public spaces. And the brilliant story is that in one of these corners where we had a conflict before with the homeless shelters, uh, residents, and some local residents, now they are actually adopting this place via this adoption program. So eventually they become the new owners. So the cohesion of the local community is growing stronger. Thank you for, for allowing me to share these three stories. It's important to start with how it, uh, how it, how it started and, um, and what this trust really means in practice, because of course, the problem was that the previous administrations uh, were just, like not very happy seeing these initiatives uh, on public spaces uh, as a sign of democracy. So practically, they would never give a permit. They would never reply to inquiries. Uh, they would um, never care about interests. And practically, that was the foundation that the municipality is evil. Bureaucracy is evil. They don't want to talk to us. Uh, I mean, I had the same experience as uh, being outside the municipality uh, previously. And so what the important thing was that first we had to show interest. We had to show willingness. We had to show uh, the openness to make changes towards actual and true demands and needs. And, um, and basically, that means, of course, uh, the order as well. So not just giving places and giving spaces and becoming places and making sure that there is a, there is a place to be, uh, but also that uh, and that's why I think you know, the open street is one of the, so, such a striking uh, example, because we practically made sure that you don't have to go through a six week uh, permit approval process. It's just like, OK, you know what? We want you to be here because we like you and we are open for you. So please um, drop a line and uh, and make a schedule and uh, and be there. And um, and that just turns out brilliantly because there is an awful lot of things happening in that street. Uh, so I'm really happy that uh, it really shows that to make the city a better place, uh, you know, you, we just we had this pr the proven uh, proven uh, proof of concept that we just had to make a small bureaucratic glitch, call it creative step. Uh, and then basically uh, these initiatives uh, were just finding their possibility. The thing is twofold. Uh, first of all, it's important to open the demand. So that's, that's again a bit of political. So practically by allowing uh, these interests and these, um, these demands to, to have a place and to, to, to have an ear, uh, they will be braver to, to maintain that demand regardless of who's in charge of the municipality. Uh, I think that's important because, because without active citizenship, the municipality can just uh, close its doors and uh, say goodbye to community life and, and urban life. The second is, of course, the, the harsher word legislation. Because once, uh, once these experiences are built into the actual legislative course, then, uh, then it's obviously possible to change the legislation anytime, but it still gives a stronger feeling uh, to do what is possible. And also it's, it's, an, it's an actual stronger political case as well to change uh, and take away some of these. So you will hear it in the news, uh, you will hear it in the, in the local uh, discussions. Um, so eventually uh, that's, that's strong. And of course, the third one, and that's, uh, that's, that's kind of the tricky one, actually building public spaces. So once we make these tactical changes, and we show that there is demand and there is an interest uh, to make to live uh, live city life differently, uh, and there is a different vibrancy in our public spaces. Then we build these places, and once it's built, it won't be taken back, let's say, by cars and by non non uses. Uh, it doesn't become no man's land. It uh, it will uh, forever be a foundation for activities. I mean, obviously, I can guarantee uh, that the municipality will always be open. But we we have funded and we built the foundations for these corporations to last.
Okay, fantastic. This was also very insp inspirational and nice to see how uh, how practical impacts have been made in the city uh, city of Budapest for these three uh, to, to these three uh, cases. I particularly very like the idea of adopting the space as a first step to really bringing it a bit more further to the people. Um, we have now all our speakers here uh, uh, live. And I would like to utilize the time that we have uh, uh, remaining to first ask one question, general question, to all the all of three speakers, and then have kind of mini dialogue, and finally go to the questions of the audience. We do have some really interesting questions in the audience. I will filter them the the most interesting ones because they are keep on pouring in. Probably we will need to organize another webinar, which is good. But first, the question for uh, for three of you, um, and it's somehow it. How would you define democracy and a democratic approach? What is the democratic approach in the projects that you have shown? How do you define democracy for placemaking? Please, maybe to start with Tommy and then Matthijs and then Daniel. Or Matthijs, you can start first if you want. Please, go ahead. Go ahead. Uh, <laughs> Tommy? Okay, Tommy first. No, I mean, I, I think for, for the projects that I showed, first of all, it was really interesting to learn about the, the work that's done in The Hague and, and, and Budapest. Um, I think for me the kind of the dem democratic aspect in all these projects is that we 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 create conditions for people to be experts in their in their own lives, and we bring together the experiences of multiple different people and then try to kind of make sense of that. And then I guess the kind of the democratic component in all of these projects is that that we focus on creating capabilities for free life for people. Mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. Amartya Sen, the Nobel laureate economist, says that a good life is the ability to live a life one has reason to value. And mm -hmm. I guess the kind of the Nordic approach often to freedom is that we create we we take worries away from people and we we allow people to focus on higher needs. And I think that's kind of the idea of a democracy, because we know that if we have to worry over over having housing or having um enough money on our account or safety we're not acting very smart yeah so i think the the my idea of democracy with all of these projects is that they create capabilities for for free life and open minds thanks tommy Matthijs, what would you like to add i like the expression of this good urban life i use it often in when i discuss placemaking and the potentials but Matthijs, what do you see in your project what how yeah. would you define the democratic approach yeah it's a it's a big challenge because i'm working with uh, immigrant groups and uh, people from shelters and most of the neighborhoods are not willing to accommodate these groups when i'm at a neighborhood meeting and I ask who wants uh, give shelter for youngsters that come out of the uh, of the shelter. A majority uh, refuses and say not here in this neighborhood. We are too vulnerable. We have already so much uh, people with uh, that need social help. There's not in this neighborhood. Choose another one. And yeah, all yeah. the neighborhoods of the Hague, I had the same answer. And also the example of uh, Willem Dreeshuis, the citizens were opposed. So. The local government decided we first announce that it will be come and then we talk. And then uh, you have a lot of protests. At the same time, uh, you need to do that. Otherwise, you have never a place for these groups. And it's our challenge to uh, overcome this uh, sorrows and to mm -hmm. give opportunity for uh, the question, how can it be profitable for the neighborhood? How can you use a common space in the building? How can you make access to the common garden so that people from the neighborhood can also uh, go in the garden and maybe have some uh, some little uh, space for their own garden um, to think about the facade i told uh, mm -hmm. it was very uh, uh very awful um, wall so it can improve the quality of uh, the neighborhood but mm -hmm. it is a challenge and you have also to bother how can i uh, 
um, can give space for all the different people. For example, young people are not willing to go to a citizens meeting, so mm -hmm. you have to look to, for them. For example, we uh, took contact with the, the graphic school to ask students, how can, what is your perception of the, the building? What are your ideas to improve it? With your knowledge, mm -hmm. can you interview also people from the neighborhoods? Right. So we have to do an extra effort to also reach other groups than the normal suspects in the neighborhood uh, so that uh, there will be an equal uh, inbring of um, participation of all different groups. Yeah, yeah, that's a, that's a, that's a essential to try to reach as much as possible people, right? To, to have these demo wide democratic values uh, respected and also to, as you say, bridge these gaps of mistrust between different groups in the, in the neighborhood, which is a very difficult task for the <coughs> municipalities. But at the moment when you try to add some shared value or bring some kind of palpable value like a facade or a garden or whatever, then it's, a, it's a already half of the bridge. Um, Daniel, what is your comment on what how the democracy looks like in these processes of public innovation and, and placemaking? Tough one, because I tend to think about these questions when I'm riding my bike, because uh, usually I don't have much time to reflect on what actually we do, because it's just <laughs> running, <laughs> running day in, day out. Uh, but I would say that first is the welcoming, and that's true for our, our district. That's one of the most uh, diverse um, by all means of population mm -hmm. uh, in the city and overall in the city, I would feel the same, but like, first of all, people must feel welcome uh, within the city, within there, within the space, within all these discussions that we have. And once they are welcome, uh, they manage to, we manage to, to make them feel welcome then they should be able to explore themselves, express themselves. Mm -hmm. uh, that's like the next level, but possibly in my, um, in my feelings and and basically it's regardless of we talk about mobility engagement uh, new design uh, just a meeting uh, community meeting an event be that whatever mm -hmm. uh, these things always come back and eventually it's 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 just we you know everything that we do must reflect on togetherness and that it's mm -hmm. for everybody and you know age gender um culture background uh, nationality and so on and so on great great thanks daniel i see that uh, i feel that this issue of accessibility for all or inclusion for all has really a lot to do with general feeling of safety uh, that you are uh, uh, able and free to express your points also able and free to move through the public space without being afraid that some other group is going to attack you or propose something or whatever make you make you an unpleasant experience so there is a lot of uh, uh, connections between the let's say the democratic shaping of spaces and and safety in those spaces um i would like to pose two questions from the audience to each uh, to, to to all of you one is very interesting it's called it's more a, a pr practical question about how do you uh, uh, collect actually these ideas from the citizens in a way that is there a physical space for it? Is it a kind of desk that you need to organize? How do people submit these ideas? What are your actually experiences? What would be the best approach to have a physical desk or maybe to go into some digital participation uh, would be great to have uh, uh, some uh, Reflections on that. How how do you stand in your cities now or in your work, in your research work? Daniel, you can ask and then I'll go back to Tommy and then to Matthijs maybe. So just short reflections. Oh, you're yeah, being very democratic. Um, <laughs> <laughs> eventually, well, we have we have, for example, a participatory budget as well that we launched this year. Uh, we have decided on the results recently. Uh, that's just one tool, of course. Uh, could have even presented it that. Uh, and of course, depending on what, like if we have a particular project, we do, we always do have a digital platform, but most likely we will have a, we will have like a desk platform as well on the spot because mm -hmm. uh, most of our neighborhoods require that and people living there, uh, it helps, it, uh, got, it gives them an opportunity for involvement. 
a better opportunity. Uh, so it depends really what exactly the situation is. Of course, I mean the ultimate the ultimate public hearing platform is the mayor's email address <laughs> 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 that that uh, that collects it all. Um, but yeah, if you want to be more uh, more modernistic and, uh, yeah. and and true, then it's basically depending on the story. We actually every every legislation and every strategy we make, we make a bigger uh, referendum about it. Um, so there's like. Um, response platform there's uh there we have forums yeah. uh, we mm -hmm. make every neighborhood we make a public forum every month mm -hmm. uh, so we have quite a lot of interactions of very different platforms and to be honest i haven't really made my mind on one particular tool that will just solve it all yeah okay great maybe we we just need a kind of you know, virtual mayor, 24 hour a day, being open for all the emails pouring in. <laughs> uh, okay, uh, Tommy, maybe you would like to reflect on that. What, 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 do you, what do you think has more future? A really physical desk, so people come and submit their ideas or co-create, or is it more digital uh, space that we can? I mean, I would have I would have three reflections on that. Like part of my my responsibility in Helsinki was building the kind of the citizen engagement practice for the city and and I think the best experience also if I look at the projects that I showed are ones where we actually go to people rather than we ask people to yeah. come to us mm -hmm. and I think it's so easy for us at city hall to stay at city hall and expect people to adjust their I lives mean, to our schedules rather than yeah. us, us actually being slightly more vulnerable and going to people and that's kind of my first point the second point that I would highlight is that we have a tendency to jump directly to to ideas and asking for solutions and ideas versus asking for people's experience. Mm -hmm. When we when we start from people's experience, people are experts in their own lives. Yeah. Where we are, where we go directly to ideas, people's educational levels, language skills, all these kind of things come into play. I I used to run youth work for Helsinki, and you noticed significantly if kids grow up in a family where they've been told throughout their life that their their opinions matter they are much more vocal in presenting their ideas. So start from people's experience, not from their ideas. And then I, I guess the third part is that I think cities need to support an active civil society. Mm -hmm. So if, if, you, if you want ideas to, to be generated in your community, you have to have a civic layer in the city. So yeah. not just the, the relationship is not only between an individual resident and, and the system, but as... Alexis de Tocqueville wrote in his Democracy in America that, that the, the wonderful thing in the American experiment, experiment was that you have a civic layer that protects people from an authoritarian government, but also from their own selfishness. Yeah. <laughs> That's why you need kind of a civic layer in the city that needs to be supported by the city. Yeah. That's a that's a that's a very good message, and I, uh, you know, working more more in the now in Southeast Europe and the Balkans, it's a it's a message that it's really hard to bring over to the decision makers. There is a big fear of that, but there is also a culture, as you say, even from the young age, that you are not really encouraged to express your ideas all the time, even even in the even within the families. Uh, Matthijs, what, 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 what was actually the, the secret of the sex, success of the, your, your uh, the breakthrough project in Den Haag? Uh, uh, did you have a physical desk for those ideas or was it a combination with some digital uh, tools? Yeah, what's interesting is we ask uh, uh, neighborhood uh, uh, councils, uh, citizens groups, uh, to think about ideas of uh, more space for these groups. I, mean, I think you have to. Uh, uh, I, I don't believe a physical desk is, is enough. You have to be an outreach and civil servant. And we pinpoint a date for a public uh, meeting, and then we uh, we ask some stakeholders to uh, to come at the meeting, but also to bring others. For example, the citizen organization of the neighborhood. I ask uh, bring some citizens with you, and also. From the school, there's a, a council of students, and I ask them to come and also to uh, explain what is your interest. For example, there's a boring school place with only uh, stones, uh, no banks, no places to, to sit. 
this is an opportunity to think about new ideas and make it more attractive, more green, uh, more public space, more places to, to enjoy. Mm -hmm. So come at a meeting and bring your point. And that helped with, uh, it was also in the school itself was the meeting, so very, uh, no uh, barrier to come. Uh, and I think that's important. You have to uh, to uh, communicate in several uh, channels um, uh, and media and, and to ask people uh, to come and to convince them uh, it's interesting and also uh, to have your, uh, uh, your ideas and uh, to bring that together. Yes, great. That's a, that's a, that's also a very important message to try to combine as much as possible local knowledge, local local uh, local context. Because sometimes digital maybe works better for some topics, but when it's a very sensitive topic, like integrating certain vulnerable groups within a neighborhood, then one one on one contact or let's say uh, a direct approach by the civil servants to the to those neighborhoods works much better than being some kind of distant uh, yeah. uh, digital service. That's that's a very good uh, that's a very good message. Um, we are coming slowly to the to the end of the webinar and uh, we would like very much to uh, thank all the speakers but before we really wrap up, uh, I would like to call upon all of you again, just to give you a kind of closing phrase to summarize your experiences, to summarize, summarize, summarize your stories in the direction of how to build the trust between the citizens and the governments and what is the role of placemaking to that. Uh, maybe Danielle, I'll start with you, just your final uh, wrap up on this. I think being there, listening, giving space, uh, understanding, uh, taking those understandings into actions most most successfully together. Uh, these these are incredible tools and, and steps forward. Uh, we have we have we started really behind. So for a while, just to, literally just to be open and being able to listen and to react. Uh, that was already a huge step. And of course, now we are in the stage when this gets to 2.0 and mm -hmm. the whole cooperativeness is what we are doing and what I hope to be able to do even more in the, in the near future. Great. Thanks. Thanks, Daniel. Uh, Matthijs, what would be your final wrap up on or, or your final message for more public innovation in, 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 uh, in uh, in cities and how to combine it with placemaking. Yeah, I think you have to uh, to look what are the coalitions you can make with citizens. Uh, for example, the citizens want more green. Can you combine your own project with the needs of the citizens of that neighborhood and try to find some quick wins? Don't wait mm -hmm. five years before you can something see, but what can you see next summer? So then people are convinced that's a good project and I want to contribute to that. And I can be also owner of this place and to invest my time to make it better. Thanks. Thanks, Matthijs. That's a, that's a very clear message. Like don't wait for, <laughs> for the perfect idea to come or, uh, you know, the perfect constellation of stars to start a good process, but just, just do it and uh, utilize those who have initiatives there already. Uh, and, and Tommy, what would be your your final wrap up of this uh, of this webinar connecting innovation in public service and place making? I guess when I look at like successful innovation projects, I think the the common factor in them is understanding that innovation is actually a disciplined practice. It's not yeah. doing things all over the place and seeing what happens. It's really like a disciplined practice, and and especially I think where cities need to put more focus on is really framing the problem as in what mm -hmm. are we actually trying to solve here and really looking looking at it from people's point of view and combining yeah. that with data i think if you if you do that properly then the things that matthias and, and daniel were saying are easier after that but don't jump directly to to thinking of ideas and solutions focus first on like what's actually the problem that we're trying to solve and is it relevant to people Thank you. Thank you, Tommy. That's, that was a very good and clear message also from the beginning of this webinar. And that's really trying to first define the challenge before you jump into solutions, because we know that sometimes uh, city governance 
tend to pick up solutions from all over the place, say like, oh, this, this was innovative somewhere else. It will work in my city as well. I'll just do it, right? So that's a, that's a clear message to first define the problem, define the solution based on the experience of your citizens and understand them. Um, thank you so much. I think we have opened a lot of uh, good and nice perspectives on a public innovation, uh, also good and nice perspectives on placemaking. Some of them I, I, I was completely not aware of, so I learned really a lot on this <laughs> in this webinar. And uh, again, uh, thanks to the attendees and their time, and hopefully we will see you around soon with the new cycles of uh, cities in uh, placemaking uh, uh, program. Thank you so much. Excellent. Thanks. Thank thanks. you. Thanks. Thank you. Okay.